Hello, and welcome to another episode of Leader Generation brought to you by ModUp. I'm your host, Tessa Berg. Today, I'm joined by Lucy Repture, Senior E-Commerce Manager, and Jen Day, the Search and Engagement Lead, and both of them work for the European team for Colgate Palmolive. Thank you, Jen and Lucy, for joining us today. We're very excited to jump into what is the value and the role of the website for CPG brands. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you for having us. It's been a pleasure. Let's start with Lucy. Tell us a little bit about your background and the role you play at Colgate Palmolive. So hi, everyone. I'm I'm Lucy Repsha. I've been in digital roles for 15 years now um, within startups, publishing, and in CPG at Colgate Palmolive in Europe. So I've done various roles all the way from building websites, SEO, pay-per-click search, through to like full management, social media. Um, and most recently, um, I'm in e-commerce and retail media. So gone through the, the full spectrum, but I have a real passion around search. That's awesome. And to, you are also joined by Jen Day. Disclaimer, Jen and I crossed paths back when she was in the United States. So it's really nice to see you again. Tell us a little bit about your background and role at Colgate Palmolive. Um, so as Tessa, you just said, I am a born and raised Clevelander, so go Cavs. Um, I have actually a really similar background in terms of digital to Lucy. So 15 years in digital um, from a range of, you know, working for agencies, which is how Tessa and I cross paths, uh, to working for premium brands, luxury brands, and across many digital touch points. So I started with websites. And that just naturally evolved into search and social media, online PR, and then love took me to London. So I've been here for about 10 years now, um, and I've been at Col Colgate Palmolive for about four years. So part of my role is to oversee the development of our central strategies for traditional search and social media and websites. So I'm really helping to ensure that we're delivering best practices and governance and guidance to our local marketing teams. And I work closely with Lucy on holistic search. Yeah, and the way this topic even came up was I saw a post from Jen about some training and learning she was doing in search and CPG. And it caught my eye because back in the day when I was a speaker at SEO conferences, without fail, the CPG people would come up and say, well, I just don't think the website actually helps drive sales. I don't know if people are really you know, going to our website to find information about our product, like how important is it? As long as we're in the right place at the right time. Fast forward, you know, 10 years and the digital landscape has changed. The shopping landscape has changed. So I'm really excited to jump in and hear, you know, how has CPG evolved in their perspective of the role and value of not just the website, but, the, but digital and e-commerce overall. So let's jump into the first uh, question, which is when we look at this change in buying behaviors, and Lucy, I'll start with you, what, what, has, what have the shifts been that have made digital more important in the CPG buying process? It has been quite a journey in the, in the last few years. So I, I would say starting at CPG like 11 years ago when I started at Colgate Palmolive, digital was definitely a focus, but wasn't was no way as big uh, as we see it now. It's, it's dramatically changed. And there has been one huge catalyst that we've all been through, lived through, uh, which is the, the COVID pandemic. So when consumers changed a, a lot of their lifestyle, um, forced in many cases to, to change that, they also changed their research behaviors, their buying behaviors. Like a lot of shops were closed, especially in Europe where we, we both are. So lots of people had to go online and they, they found new resources to find their information. So it accelerated way past the, the, the normal trajectories of where we saw digital and, and e-commerce. And what we saw is the, the complete merging of both Jen and, and my roles, where you know, she has traditional traditional search, we call digital search, like the Google search, the Bing search, where people are looking for information and the websites. And I have the e-commerce side. And actually those two worlds merge. 
consumers were no longer just going to find their information at, at websites because they used to go in store as well. They used to look at products, physically pick them up. They couldn't do that anymore. They were going to the retailer websites to find their information. So suddenly our worlds collided and the scale just went through the roof. And so that accelerated and obviously you know, companies like ours took notice very quickly of what was going on. You know, we needed to, to work fast and to change the ways that we were working and looking at the consumer and being truly consumer centric. And then the our worlds basically changed overnight. So it's been fascinating. We're now seeing consumers change their behavior slightly. Well, actually quite quite a lot. They're going back in store, you know, freedoms are, are back, but they're, they're still using their old learned behaviors of finding the information and researching products online. Mm. So Jen, when we think about traditional search and its role in the buying process during this big shift, and even today, how has the role of search evolved? Like, have you had to change anything about the content you're putting out to respond to these changing behaviors? It's a great question. So definitely the role of search has evolved. Um, I think as a result, like it was evolving pre-pandemic and it's evolved as a result of the pandemic. So in terms of how we're evolving our search approach, it really is looking at, you know, what is the intent of the search and being as you know, consumer centric as we can be. So why are they looking for this keyword? What is it that we think would be the most relevant content to provide them? Is that relevant content going to be on our website or actually would it be better to drive them to a retailer site? So it's really just had us kind of flip our approach on its head and get as focused and specific around the keywords that we're going to be focusing on and really um, thinking about and sweating what that consumer experience is going to be across the people journey based on that keyword intent where we're driving them. So it, in my past, whenever we've talked about, you know, where to drive a customer, there's always been this tension of, or even different departments within the company are handling offline retail sales versus e-commerce. And sometimes e-commerce folks are locked in their own little bubble, you know, away from the marketing team and, and SEO. So what do marketers need to change today in order to break down those walls? And, and what have what have you done at Colgate Pomal that has allowed you to sort of work through that tension that existed before the pandemic? I think some things that we've tried to do and are, um, you know, it's a journey, right? So we've started to put some different practices in place, uh, but I think identifying a kind of the owners and drivers of those consumer insights in our organization. So obviously it usually falls on, um, falls within marketing, right? But what are any consumer insights we can be getting from our customer development teams and how do the CD and the marketing teams work together to share those insights across the business? Because we know that that data is going to be really critical in informing, you know, the value of our messaging, our creative, our product positioning, whatever it might be. So I think that's one of the ways um, we've started working on how we can break down those silos and, and share data. And Lucy, you mentioned before, you know, it's all about being customer centric from a functional standpoint. How does that change the way you market, communicate and sell your products? It's actually quite a big change. So traditionally companies such as ours has a product, you know, we have a, a great team of marketers who are highly skilled in, in bringing that product to market based on its claims, you know, it, what it can do for the consumer. That's now been flipped on its head. So if you're really going consumer centric, it's what does the consumer want? And so you need to pick up the signals based on that. So what are they looking for? So Jen mentioned keywords earlier, highly important. What trends are coming up in keywords? So are, are we seeing them look for different ingredients? Are we seeing them look for, for different types of benefits? And then from there, you can use different tools to figure out from those types of searches, where are they going? Where are they looking? And they may be seeking information at a retailer. So, you know, significant searches start on retailers such as Amazon now. That's the first point on which a consumer will go and have a look for information. You know, you've got fantastic content there, reviews, highly influential. And then then they may go on to like a, a website where, you know, the, the wells of like Jen's, what she's developing comes into play. But it's starting up 
what's what are they looking for and then what can we do about that so looking at what's in the market for that type of thing is there a gap in the market how can we play it's it's a different way of looking at things and the same thing for content it's no longer acceptable to talk about the product in the way the brand wants to talk about the product you have to see what the consumers are asking for you know read reviews what language do they use and, and, and play it back to them it's it's very much the consumer has to be in the center every time you create something you need to ask is this suitable is this what the consumer wants so i think the pandemic obviously lasted a lot longer than we all thought it would and i guess, i don't know if it's still going on but <laughs> uh how can you tell when behavior is a short term trend versus long term because i know some of the things we're talking about sound really good let's be customer centric let's make sure the products where they want to buy it but functionally that could require some major shifts and you know there are different relationships that exist as you obviously know between e-commerce engines and different profit margins so how do you know when it's a good idea to follow that consumer behavior because it's going to be something that's sustained in the long term versus you know what this might be short and we have to do what we have to do now tell me a little bit about that process it's a very difficult equation and none of us have a crystal ball so it's very hard i think to do this right you're going to have to be courageous and accept that there are going to be failures you know with every five five ideas that you have one could be successful but the others may fall at the wayside and it's that test and learn approach you know agile approach to marketing you know small scale tests you know we you don't have to go into full production straight away with an idea like test it test one market it's that type of approach will help you find to see if something is a long term growth or is you know a flash in the pan something that just comes up comes down again and, and you know not worth worth the effort to go into I think in the past, a lot of companies ha have waited too long to act. And then the trend has gone, you know, other more agile players have come in, like smaller brands, you know, they've, they've taken that space. And then it's a lot harder to get in once someone else is established. And at the beginning of the call, you mentioned SEO, like search engine optimization is not just on a website. It's also on a retailer website. So working towards the algorithms of the retailers, building your content, owning those keywords early can establish your relevancy and, and you can be, you can own that space. So it's, yeah, I would say the best approach is be courageous and test and learn. Like find those signals, track them, constantly track, constantly be curious of what's going on. And then find those, find the ones that you think have legs and then test. I love that approach. Um, that's I've I'm obsessed with data, so I've always loved testing because you never know if you're right until you try. So to recap where we're at in this journey, we want CPG brands, or I guess I'm saying I want, but you you guys are making any demands of anyone. But if you're a CPG brand listening, start with your internal data. Find who has the deepest knowledge of that customer then look at search behavior across different channels. I like that you mentioned that Amazon has become a way that people research products. Doesn't always mean they're going to buy it there, but Amazon for your products to be really successful, you have to have all those different views. I have found it's very easy to read the label, <laughs> the Amazon shots, and I'm seeing more CPG brands start to just pull some of those basic images onto their sites, make it easier to research and choose where you buy. But let's move into how this has impacted marketing tactics. So I have a good sense of my customer. I'm going to be courageous and start testing small to learn what will work based on that data. How have you seen a shift in the way you prioritize go-to-market tactics or strategies? And uh, Lucy, we'll, we'll start with you. So that actually go-to-market strategies, it, it may be online first. It's probably the biggest shift that we've done. It, it may be in some cases, you know, direct to consumer. No, there's lots of ways that we can test products and and see if they work. Like small scale marketing budgets, you know, looking at advertising on a retailer first, seeing what insights we can get and use 
those strategies, those insights for the for the larger, more integrated campaigns later on if the product is successful. So again, I'm talking about that that test and learn. It's it's very much that nature as well when it when it comes into go to market strategies. It, it's not always the the big pow straight in everything in. It, it's sometimes a bit more of a you know start and stop, learn as we go, learn a pivot, change, and then. And then you get a successful equation. When you do have the data, that's when it's really powerful. So if you can do close loop uh, attribution, then you know, life's a winner. It's very rare. Um, it's mm -hmm. very hard to get. Um, but that, you know, that is what to be striving for. So that is a massive shift. When I worked at a CPG company, I felt like us in the digital department were like the black sheep, you know, it's like the retail team, the people on the sales team that sold into retail, they were the heroes. And we were like, whatever's happening over in crazy land digital is what's happening. So that is such a massive shift. So Jen, tell me a little bit in these, in this shift to digital first, how do we know that being customer centric, starting to look at where they begin their journey is working? It's a good question. Um, so Lucy and I try to approach everything um, as holistically as we can. The business in general, we're trying to approach things more holistically. Um, so from an omni-channel perspective, uh, in my wheelhouse, looking at more you know, traditional search and social, we'll be looking at um, any indication that this is working based on a growth in impressions or in clicks, click through rate, engagement on the site, but then also we would be looking at things like share of voice, share of search, um, how sentiment is growing and changing and anything in terms of, you know, an increase in, in brand mentions, um, factors like that. So a good blend of um, qual and quan, but then from more of a retail and e-commerce um, space, Lucy, happy to get your thoughts on that one. It's a challenging area um, in the e-commerce world. It, over many, many years of, you, you mentioned about the e-commerce teams being siloed off. It's very true. And also a lack of real KPIs. ROAS, return on ad spend, has been a, a go-to for, for many, many brands. But it has serious implications for, for going after ROAS. Yes, becomes uh, you know, an a good metric of return on what you've spent on, but it doesn't give you the full picture. So naturally with the search algorithms, and any, you know, any retail media algorithms, it goes towards the, the most likely people to purchase, but they're normally your customers already. So you're just cannibalizing and you end up pulling yourself into a situation where you cannot grow because you're hitting with frequency so high on you know this small group of people that, you know that will click and will buy but they would have probably already purchased so you're not growing your share of market you, you, you're not growing your brand so we've been you know re-educating the company about you know return on investment versus ROAS so some of the metrics are very similar to Jen's you know, share of voice you know how visible are we and then looking at new to brand metrics as well as sales. Sales is never going to go away, obviously, um, but product pages. So we know that you know over 60 percent of people are digitally influenced with what they see on the PDP pages at retailers. So we need glance views. We, we need eyes on our content that we spent a lot of time and effort creating this great content and reading the reviews, you know, of our, you know, our great products. So it, it's very much looking at um, you know, clicks, you know, lands on page, sales, uh, new to brand metrics, but also the, bringing into the topic at the very beginning, SEO, we know that our organic ranking is extremely important as well as our paid ranking on these channels. So we'll also be tracking that. So, uh, you know, a, a key KPI for us, and I know Jen has this as well, paid and organic working together, one influences the other. It's, it's this full cycle going around we cannot ignore that in our return on investments for long-term growth. I love that answer because it tells CPG marketers that if you haven't started looking at digital as a way to grow your brand, then you're missing a huge opportunity. Exactly. I yeah. That when we use return on ad spend and we invest a lot in what I'll call quote unquote brand channels for awareness, to your point, we are hitting a lot of the same people and is it really providing value 
back to your customer centric approach. So if we want to provide value to the customer and be customer centric and let them buy where they need, then we have to use that search and social data first to see where can we grow? How do we respond to what they want and the information they need? And then layer in the other tactics. So I think that gives marketers a really clear priority on you know, where to start and what to prioritize first. Uh, I do think you both are very courageous because this is, you know, you're, you're, these answers sound so easy, but I know that in, internally, it is really hard to sort of push these new ways of thinking. And do you think that there are any specific channels or specific skills that marketers need to start building, especially in CPG, to help them keep up with, or maybe not even keep up, because I've never met a bad CPG marketer. Like, CPG marketers are some of the most savviest, but what are some of the emerging channels that maybe they just need to keep their eye on where we see consumers going now, places maybe they haven't gone before to find more information and engage with the brand? And uh, Lucy, you want to start? Uh, yeah, I can, I can talk about the channels. So you know, in my world, one of my greatest passions recently is retail media. So uh, a lot of time, traditional marketers in CPG wouldn't have touched this. It would be in the shopper teams, the, the sales teams. So, you know, they're not as familiar with, you know, how the retailers work. So, you know, certainly get familiar with what's going on in the retail media world, you know, get close to the teams, you know, work collaboratively. So omnichannel world, you know, teams need to be working together. And linking to that, to like general skills that they need, need to be thinking about is, marketers need to be commercial marketers. You know, it, it's not one or the other, uh, especially in the omnichannel world. The consumer doesn't make the distinction and nor should we. So that flow of information, that partnership, it needs to be, needs to be constant. And I'd, the other change I would say is get ready and get familiar with data, be comfortable with data, and, you know, it, build up your data skills. That, that is definitely gonna be an essential part of the, the future of marketing. Yes, I agree. Jen, do you have anything to add? And have you seen specifically data? Because search people, we typically just really love data. <laughs> but have you seen any other uses where even the use of data or the use of information from search and social and research has begun to evolve um, where marketers have an opportunity to leverage it more? I mean, I think just leveraging, thinking about SEO data, I think that's something that isn't leveraged as much as it could be across other channels. So, you know, people also ask data, taking that, using it as a way to test different headlines for your CRM or any of your email campaigns. I think just lifting and sharing data across other channels like social media or, you know, a CRM just to get to know your audience more is something that we could start doing more of, um, as CPG marketers across the board. Um, but then I also think social commerce is a place that we need to continue to focus on and to um, upskill as CPG marketers. You know, millennials are super comfortable with e-commerce. Gen Z is even more comfortable with social commerce. It's really all about the experience there. You know, the algorithm can tailor what you're seeing, what you're being targeted with. Um, and that is just going to have a more personalized shopping experience that we know more and more people want. So I think that is an area where it can remove some of the friction between product searching, product desire and checkout. And um, that's an area that I think all CPG marketers should keep an eye on and keep upskilling on because it can also impact offline sales in retail environments, you know, we're seeing more TikTok made me buy it stickers, it's on packs, it's, you know, point of sale. So the offline and the online there is just a place that we should keep more focus on because we know that the omni-channel shopper is present and exists. You know, people aren't as likely to be exclusively online shoppers or offline shoppers like we may have been thinking a bit more pre-pandemic. Yeah, I agree. I think that sort of emergence of social shopping, even though I buy a ton of clothing because I saw it on Instagram, when I saw the stats of how common that is, that over like 80% of millennial women research and buy on Instagram or because they saw it on Instagram or TikTok, mm -hmm. I was like, holy crud. For some reason, I felt like I was like the only one. And I like, <laughs> like where did I know. you 
I know because I think you grow up with like you wouldn't yeah because I think you grow up with like you wouldn't trust to buy something that you know like I don't know but you know it was as seen on TV used to be the thing like remember when you go to CVS yeah. and you'd see the end cap of all the things that were advertised on TV this is just the evolution of that yeah and do you think that's going to continue in some ways or is there an opportunity for it to get more immersive or deeper with some web three tools is that have oh you that's a great question? point it's it's something that I mean I think the the answer that you would assume to that is yes um you know more in-app features more um augmented reality and everything that's going to just create that personalized experience more so I think you can expect that that is going to be um, a direction that more and more brands are going and exploring and investing in in the future. Um, who knows what the future holds with that necessarily, but I think it's just going to be a really interesting space to watch. And especially as more and more social commerce will be driven by influencer marketing, uh, you know, brands are continuing, of course, to invest and, you know, to identify um, who can really create a lot of conversation, uh, be that nano or like micro or macro influencer. So I think that's another way that influencer marketing will help to continue to drive social commerce, um, but in a way that is going to feel, you know, I hate the word, but really authentic uh, to that brand. Um, and it's something that we see working already and has been working for years for digital first or digital native brands. Yes. So we've seen content play a really important role in the success of e-commerce and selling online and, and driving offline sales. And so far we've covered that you need the data, you need to know what they're looking for in order for that to really make an impact and be of value to the customer. Um, Lucy, do you see content evolving as you know we continue down this path of digital first, omni-channel marketing and bringing in these new emerging tools for both web 2.0 and web 3? Definitely. Uh, there is always a, a, a fine balance between like, heaviness of assets and you know speed of loading mobile devices uh, alongside you know making the best enriched experience. But most certainly, like you know, having video assets for the near future, definitely. You know, that's going to become commonplace across many of the different retailers. But you know, all of the virtual reality stuff that could come in, you know, the possibilities are endless. And not to mention the digital within the store. So as more than the omnichannel world, more people are looking for experiences when they do physically go into school. It's it become an entertainment. Like it was missing for so long in our lives that once we're there now, we, we you know we expect more out of that out of that situation. So emerging digital within the space of the store, you know, digital displays, making it personalized, linking it up with the signals and, and what we know of you from, you know, programmatic within retail media or even, you know, search interaction, your buying behavior, linked to your loyalty cards. You know, that's a whole other aspect as well that we haven't touched on yet. But that that those merging of those worlds linked in with maybe the entertainment factor that could come in, you know, virtual reality, you know, bringing things to life within store is, I think, quite an exciting space. And, and I think that the more you connect offline to online and you make it entertaining and engaging, the more opportunities you have to gather first party data and collect more on signals. And I like that all of your answers have been around intent and signals and how people are interacting with the product as a means of informing what you do next and measuring. I think that's a very big shift from where we were as marketers, where we really did rely on third-party data to find my customer who looks like this. Um, and now we're saying, we're seeing these behaviors here, that means X, and we're putting the onus on us to develop the right experience for that behavior. We, we sort of like glossed over it, but that's a, that's a really massive shift in the way that I feel like you're already prepared for third-party data to go away. So it, it really, again, back to that customer centric, you know, how does the customer want us to engage being respectful of their privacy? And we're, we're looking at, hey, because you're doing this, what's the best experience for you online and offline? Um, Jen, have you begun to, what has it been like from the search and social world and sort of using the more behavioral intent to, uh, to help develop that right kind of content to bring that experience together? It's a really interesting one because it's um, 
or at least from my perspective, you know, obviously it's not just uh, one team who's creating the content, you know, you're getting your insights team involved um, and to get that data, you're working with your um, brand marketers to make sure that any content that's getting created is um, the right positioning, the right message, et cetera. But in terms of how we're, we're really leveraging that and using it, uh, you know, a lot of social listening is helping to drive um, the type of content and the style of content that we know our consumers are more interested in. Um, you know, even if that, that might be a bit of a shift in, in approach for what we're used to. Um, but having the data there is really helpful because I think it gives you the courage to try and test something new. Um, but it is making quite a difference in terms of like the style of the assets that we're, we're creating and being a, being more focused on being, of course, like people centric, customer centric, but also being, um, uh, channel focused. And what I mean by that specifically is, you know, creating the right type of content for, you know, for a, a meta property or creating the right kind of um, short format video for, you know, be it TikTok or be it YouTube short, but getting really more focused on, we're not just going to create one asset and, you know, chop it up uh, to be the right dimensions, but really being more focused on what would our consumers on this channel specifically like to see? So while we are very focused on an omni-channel approach, we're still making sure that we're delivering the right type of content for where our audience is. It's just also about making sure that depending on where they are in the consumer journey, we're having the consistency in the message, but delivering them the style of content that they'd like to see wherever they are. And Lucy, how have you seen the impact of making sure it's right content, right experience, and the right channel uh, drive sales? Has there, as that gets better and better, are you seeing that down funnel generate revenue? Definitely. So there was a time that Jen was alluding to where you find the TV ad plastered everywhere just because we had the asset. Oh, we'll use it. It's not the right asset you know, not right place, um, right location, right right part of the journey. Uh, so it, it was, we were paying for something that wasn't fulfilling. And the good part is in retail media, we can measure that. So when we know, when we create something that's based on the intent of that search term or or that place within the site or the behaviors that we know about that, that shopper, we will get much better conversion rates. It's significant the conversion rate increase that we get and that's great to feedback to the business instant feedback loop we created something right location right content for the for the right people and here are our results we do more of that you know we, we can we can improve like dramatically and like our our return on investment will go up but it again like it has to be we have to know where someone is in the journey to know exactly what type of content what messages they want and that also goes back to you know social listening um you know looking at reviews what language and what what are shoppers telling us consumers telling us that they want to hear when they're doing these researches because you know the messy middle in particular you know they're backwards and forwards they could look you know 20 30 plus sites between retailer brands before they may make their brand choice so somehow we've got to cut through that we have to stop them what's that experience and that's providing them what they need being helpful and and, and that's what we are trying to do we're not perfect no way. It's a learning process and we'll constantly improve. Well, thank you very much, both of you, for being on the podcast today. I think that we have a lot of tools to develop this discipline of being digital first in CPG. Uh, and it is a discipline. This is a major shift and it requires uh, a lot of the process changes that we've talked about today and upskilling. Before we get off, I was actually wondering who do you follow anyone or what are there any books or trainings that you would recommend for CPG marketers to kind of help make this transition evolution or really sell it in again like sometimes I think the marketers know that it's really a, a matter of helping to bring the rest of the company along to to work through that tension to, to get to the point of collaboration that's necessary to be customer centric do you have any recommendations on books or blogs or that you follow that have really um, helped you get to where you are today? I really enjoy Think with Google. I mean, I think they just have really nice content that gets put out regularly. Um, 
some of their, you know, some of their trainings as well, I think are, you know, short, um, quick. If you're a CPG marketer, you've been in digital for a long time, it's still good to just have a bit of a refresher there too. So yeah, think with Google is a big one for me. Um, I love podcasts. I love them so much. Uh, I probably consume way too many podcasts, but um, there's also an app called Headway, uh, which is one of those apps that basically summarizes a long chapter book in, you know, seven to 15 minutes. So I'm a big fan of Headway um, and consume a lot of great books there. There are also some um, more long form article content there and essays. So yeah, I would definitely check out Headway. Oh, that's awesome. I've never heard of that. I love that. Yeah, it's really good. I like it. Uh, Lucy, do you have any suggestions? Yeah, the, the, the CPG guys um, always, always pay attention to what, what's going on there. It also, it's really interesting with like, you mentioned that the Google's like Amazon as well, like their releases and the documentation obviously take them, you know, produced by the, by the retailer themselves, but, you know, very interesting reads when they do come out, you know, big industry trends, um, e-marketer has, you know, great stats insights. You know, we've like personally, Jen and I have used Circus Street for like small trainings, very bite-sized trainings, like the longest is half an hour. And you, you can pick, you know, there's hundreds of different topics in there to, to fill your curiosity. And I think information is everywhere. And, you know, there's, there's lots of tools out there that you can, you can get keyword data from the, you know, even the Google, Google uh, keyword planner tool, you know, fantastic insights and Google trends, like huge things that you can find out for free mm -hmm. um, just by doing, being curious and having a look around. Well, thank you again for being on the show. If people want to find you and reach out for to continue this conversation, where can they find you, Lucy? Uh, so LinkedIn, um, obviously I'm there. Um, feel free uh, to make contact. <laughs> and Jen? Yeah, same for me. LinkedIn's the best place to reach me. Well, thank you very much for joining us again today. If you want to hear more episodes of Leader Generation, you can find us on LinkedIn. It is the Leader Generation podcast brought to you by ModOp or visit ModOp's website at modop.com.